you know, these days I'm looking for 15 to 20 grand per, per deal. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of that profit margin we're looking at. And so we can afford to um, cherry pick, you know, and even though I'm in, you know, arguably one of the most competitive markets in the country, we just do different and better marketing than everybody else. Right. And so, although I'm not buying anything at the trustee sales anymore, cause there's really nothing to buy there right now. We just got really, really good at marketing. Hey, what's up everybody? Jamel Gibbs here. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another podcast episode. Today we have yet another special guest. Uh, you guys know I love to bring special guests on the line. Uh, today we have someone that I've met a couple of years ago, uh, again, in the speaking circuit, just like with some of our previous, uh, our previous guests that we've had. Uh, we were under the same umbrella, uh, under the, within the speaking circuit, we were under the same umbrella. And uh, I'm not sure, are you still doing uh, events these days, Andy? We, we, we did our last event, my, my partnership and I did our last event in September and then we're not going to do any more together. I'm going to start doing them on my own Got it. Uh, probably later this year. We're, I'm still kind of getting through the fulfillment still with uh, the previous partnership. But yeah, um, and I'm still doing, I'm doing some speaking. I don't know if you knew this. I was doing some, I'm doing speaking for a uh, note school as well. So awesome, man. Eddie speed. Yeah. yeah. With Eddie. Yep. Uh -huh. Oh, fantastic, man. Great group there. And, um, you know, I, I plan on getting Eddie on the uh, podcast sometime in the future as well. Man. He's good he's a master at the notes. Oh man. Well, not just that. He's a master on the creative finance, man. I mean, just yeah. getting deals that you didn't think you could get, you know, these days. I mean, it's actually changed. Just, just speaking for him has actually changed a big portion of my wholesale business for wow. sure. Yeah. Wow. Look at that, man. I, I just, I, you know, I know he's down in Houston, isn't he? Uh, Dallas. Dallas, Dallas. I was just in Houston last week. I, I went there on Thursday and um, I came back on Friday, but I went to go speak at AC's uh, yep. networking. Yep. networking event i had a really good time there man it was awesome that's awesome yeah i spoke at a jet lending's deal about two or three weeks ago in houston yeah man yeah it's pretty it's pretty awesome i, I, I love houston man I, I plan on going back in a few weeks with my wife just to spend a nice. week in there and have some fun man but looking forward to that you know nice nice but hey man why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself how you got started in real estate let's, let's dig into the meat and potatoes it is okay sure for sure yeah i know um Boy, it's going back now uh, 20 years. Holy cow. Uh, my, well, actually, if you even go back further, my dad was a home builder. So I, I kind of grew up, he, he had me working in the trades when I was pretty young, you know, so whether it was laying tile or framing, I mean, I was framing houses in Arizona when I was 16 years old in the summer, wow. you know, which was brutal work. But, um, but that was my first foray into real estate. I realized I didn't want to be a builder. Um, and I read Robert Kiyosaki's book in like 99 believe it or not, like right after it first came out, Man. Rich Poor Dad, yeah. Right around the time I read it. I, I read that book as a junior in high school, 1998, man. Nice, you know, that, nice. that book changed my life. Oh, for sure. And so many people's and mine as well. And so I was, I'm a little bit older than you, but I was like uh, in my mid 20s. So I was out of college and I remember, well, actually the way I even had found out about the book, this is crazy. I happened to not be working that day or I was done early or something and I had the TV on and I'm never watching TV in the afternoon at that age. I mean, not now either, but, um, and Oprah was on, okay. For whatever reason, I'm watching <laughs> Oprah and Kiyosaki was the guest on the Oprah show. And that's how I found out about his book. Wow. No wow, joke. Man. Yeah. So I, I went, I've I ever went, seen a, an episode of Oprah myself, man. <laughs> yeah. So then I went to the Barnes and Noble, picked up that book read it from like cover to cover, like in a day. And then I went back and I think he had the cash flow quadrant out then too. Yeah. And so I bought that. I bought anyway, that too. But I was pretty young. And, and my takeaways from that book were really three things. It was um, cash flow, real estate, foreclosures, right? And, and in my young mind, I thought foreclosures was the only way to invest in real estate, you know, because I knew my dad and he was a builder, but that didn't seem like investing to me. That was like his business, you know? Right. And so, I, uh, I just went out looking for somebody that knew how to do the foreclosure business. Cause to me, that was, that was investing. I didn't know anything else about how to invest in property. Not like you and I know how to today, but, but right. back then I thought that was the only way you could invest in real estate was through foreclosures. And so I found two guys that were, um, uh, buying properties at the trustee sale here in uh, Phoenix. And, uh, they, uh, 
they needed some help with their construction side of their business. They were buying stuff at the courthouse steps and then they were fixing it up and then retailing it. And they were having a little bit of trouble with their, their construction crews or whatever. I had a construction background just cause I'd been working with my dad. And so I, uh, I kind of went to work for him for about 10 days on a, like a short term contract, just like as a consultant, just to kind of help them bring this construction side of their business around. And, um, after that 10 days, they, they figured out that I, had a bigger desire than just to be a construction consultant that I really wanted to understand and know this business. And so they gave me an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. And um, the deal essentially was uh, they, they had a business that was about 250 grand in the hole. All right. So it was in the red and they said, Hey, look, if you come on and work for us at bare, bare minimum, you know, like just the most minimum salary you can, we'll teach you this whole business. And if you help us turn it around, we'll let you buy 50% of it at whatever point that is in the future. Wow. And I was like, done. So I'm like 24 years old. I mean, I don't have anything to lose, you know? And so uh, they, they had me sit down and kind of write out my expenses or whatever it was. And I remember I, I got paid $27,000 a year before taxes, but I was willing to do that because I wanted to learn this business so bad, you know, and it barely yep. paid my rent and whatever. And, you know, I didn't have any wife or kids or anything at the time. So it was all good. And I just, for the next two years, I just put my head down. And I was like a sponge. And I learned awesome. everything I could about this business. Yep. Awesome, man. That's a great story because, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, I love the fact that you came in working for someone else yeah. and kind of figured it out after. I didn't do that. And a lot of people think that you have to come in and you got to keep all the profits yourself. You know, th that's the epitome of, you know, learning the business, in my opinion. Find someone to help you do it, even if you got to work for free. You know, yeah. in your case, you got paid $27,000 a year. Which yeah, is awesome. But, you know, most people get sidetracked by that. They, they get blindsided thinking that, you know, I can do this on my own. I came into the business that way. It took me 13 months to get my first check. My first check was $1,500. Had I uh, had someone show me how to do this, I could have sped that up. And ultimately, I would have been able to, um, you know, who knows? I, I would have been light years ahead of where I am today. I don't know. But the For whole sure. point is having a mentor, having someone show you how to do this yes. is, the, is the key. It really is. Uh, a lot of people have the willpower, um, but they just don't have the drive. They, they want to do it, but they don't have the drive. And that's what the, the mentor is there. Keep, oh, you out of, sure. keep you from making mistakes and also to keep you uh, pressing forward. And that's exactly what the benefit of a mentor is. Oh, for you know? sure. I mean, if you don't have a mentor... It is going to take you magnitudes longer yep. to earn. Um, the trial and error is going to be so big and the cost is going to be so heavy. I mean, yep. you know, I've sold coaching personally where we've charged as much as a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and some people are like, well, that's insane. Why would somebody pay you a hundred thousand dollars? And I can tell you for a fact that the amount of money that I've lost on deals because I didn't have the right mentorship on yep. is vastly more than that. Absolutely, so, man. Yeah. hundred percent agree with that. hundred 110% agree. I spend money on uh, education every single year, yep. masterminds and things like that. I yep. just joined another mastermind a couple weeks ago. Yep. And, um, you know, if I can spend even more money on this stuff, I, I will do it consistently. For sure. It's, you know, it, it just helps me to continue to grow my business. And it also lights the fire. You know, I was at a mastermind uh, in Tampa just a few months ago. Mm. And since then, I just started cranking out more and more content. It's just something I love to do. My real mm. estate business is booming, you know, and it's just because I'm surrounding myself with people who are just like me and want to improve as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it just keeps building you up. I mean, at the end of the day, the number one best investment you can ever make is in yourself. So if That's you're not right. willing to invest in yourself, you don't believe in yourself. And if you don't believe in yourself, there's really no hope for you anyway. That's right, man. And so, so you, you got to get after it. That's it, man. So let's talk about, uh, you know, we were just talking a little bit before we jumped on the line here and you were talking about how you're primarily focused on wholesaling right now. Yes. Um, kind of getting out of the rehab thing. Let's talk about that. Why the change of heart? Uh, well, this isn't necessarily for, this isn't advice necessarily for anybody listening to this show. This is a personal choice. Got so it. I'll tell you exactly why 
this is where I'm at. And I have gone back and forth between wholesaling and fixing flipping for 20 years, right? Same here. Uh, yep. I mean, for the first two years of my business when I was learning and that's all I did was fix and flip. And then we turned into wholesaling and we were the largest wholesaler in Arizona for many years, doing as much as a thousand houses a year at one point. And, um, you know, and I expanded into multiple different markets. So I've kind of gone back and forth depending on the market. The market is not the reason why I'm not whole, uh, fixing and flipping right now, or I'm, uh, the market's great, right? So like you would think fixing and flipping would be an awesome time to do that right now. And I would say, yes, absolutely. The reason is we're talking about masterminds here just a second ago. So I'm in a mastermind group as well. And my group knows, um, I mean, part of, part of being a part of a mastermind group is to hold each other accountable, say, Hey, here's what I hear you saying. Um, here's what I think you ought to do, you know? And, and so my group had heard me over a you know, probably two or three different sessions over the course of a year kind of have the same complaint. I'm spread too thin. I got too much going on. I, yep. I can't, I can't take on anymore. And I'm just not doing well with what I've got because I'm doing too much. And so I finally took their advice, which was get focused, right? Get focused on what's really working for you right now. And you've got to get down to just one or two things, right? One or two big things. So I speak right? So that's one thing. I'm not getting rid of that. And um, I, I've been doing really well at wholesaling for, for years. And so that's just a business I've always had. And so the, the fixing and flipping, when it really came down to it, and I looked at it, um, it's the thing that causes me the most aggravation. It gives me the most heartburn. <laughs> it gives me, you know, it's got, it's just the most stressed out. And, it, and it's because I don't have a ton of a passion around it. I can make money at it but it's not my thing, you know? And so some yeah. people, like I've got clients of mine that like they're all into the design and they love yeah. you know, putting the yeah. house, like I could care less about that. I just want the money, you know? <laughs> and, and as you know, with fix and flips, there's always moving parts and stuff that's just, you know, unexpected and, it, and it's a huge- Absolutely, oh man. Let me tell you this, man. Um, about two, three, about three years ago, you know, I stopped, I slowed down on my events about two years ago now. And right around that time, I took on a house I should have made $100,000 on. And um, ultimately, I ended up uh, selling that house, not at a loss, but we basically broke even. Uh, my payments on that house, I mean, it was, it was costing me about 3000 bucks a month to own the house. Right. right. From that time forward, I really looked at my business and I slowed down on doing my rehabs in my local area. Well, on in any area, in my local area, especially, but in any area, I just mm -hmm. slowed down on doing rehabs. I actually started doing new construction. But um, the reason for that was because of all of the headaches that I was getting uh, from, uh, you know, working with contractors, making sure things was done on time, making sure, you know, we were meeting deadlines and things like that. Right. It was just, you know, you can eliminate all of that by just focusing on wholesaling. Yes, you're going to make less money, but uh, you're going to make faster money. So do you want the slow, the slow dime or the fast nickel? That's, That's right. How you have to look at it. Yeah. I'm going to take the fast nickel over the slow dime these days. I started off just like you as a rehabber. I got into wholesaling, you know, so, um, you know, for, for the most part, you know, I love the fact that you, you really started narrow, you started focusing, narrowing down what it is that you're, you're looking to do. And you've done it already. You said you were doing close to well, a thousand houses a year. At one point, I haven't done that. I haven't, I can't say that I've bought a thousand houses in one year yet. And I'm actually intrigued to, to hear a little bit more about that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about that. So the only way I was able to do that, and that was in one market, by the way. Now, there was years after that, that we came pretty close to that number, but we were in multiple markets. Um, so I'll tell you, it was kind of a perfect storm of two different things that was going on. One, uh -huh. um, I only was buying those deals at the trustee sale, right? At the foreclosure auction, right? So I didn't get a deal from anywhere else but the trustee sale. So, so that's one thing. Really? Um, the second thing is, is this was in 2003, that year I did a thousand houses, this is a long time ago. So, uh, you know, I don't like talking about how great I was back then, but you know, this is, this is, uh, this is legit. So in 2003, that was the year we did a thousand houses. And the reason why was because it wasn't that, I mean, not that the internet didn't exist. Of course it did, but there was nothing out there that told you yeah. how to find, you know, what was going to auction every single day. And so the only person, the only people that knew how to do it compiled their own data, right? And you had your own database. I mean, I used 
Access at the time, Microsoft Access. I don't even think that exists anymore, but we had our own database that we tracked all the sales with, right? So I'd show up down at the sales and I'd have this like big stack of paper um, every single day that had everything that I was going to bid to and what properties we were going to go to. And I, we bid on everything that was a deal every single day, right? I mean, like there was nothing that was we wouldn't bid on. We were bidding to buy everything up to a certain point, you know, whatever made sense financially that we thought we could sell to our customers. And, um, and so when there's very few other people in the market that know how to do that, that had, had figured out how to go bid. I mean, this, it's not ever going to exist again. I mean, it will in some other form or fashion, right. but not at the foreclosure auctions. Cause now it's like, geez, in a lot of counties, you can go bid online. I mean, like you can almost be like, uh, uh, you don't need any experience whatsoever. And so those yeah. prices just get bid through the roof. And so we were just kind of at this perfect storm early in the infancy of, of this business and we're able to scale it. I also um, partnered up, actually kind of merged with my largest competitor. And so between that merger happening in 2003 and nobody else having access to that data, they had to come through us to buy and we just bid on everything crushed it man huh crushed it yeah and i mean i'm not saying we didn't have anybody else we were competing against we certainly did but you know we were the number one in the market and the phoenix metro is the fifth largest city in the country so we just Large had a whole area. bunch yeah. yeah we just had a whole bunch of things going in our favor you know it was just it was good timing you know i mean yeah. i don't want to make it sound like we were geniuses or anything because we weren't we were just we knew what we were doing nobody else knew how to do it or very few did and and there wasn't, you know, you go down there today. I mean, well, if you were down there, like say 2011, when there was a gazillion foreclosures going on, right. Uh -huh. There was a hundred people a day down there bidding. I mean, yeah. when I used to go down and bid in 2003, if there was 10 people, it was a busy day. 10. Now, you know what it is? Everybody's a real estate investor these days. Right. While the, while the market is hot. Because right. Once the market changes, we'll see what happens. Oh what yeah. What happened 10 years, 12 years ago. You know, um, some of those guys never came back in. Oh, for sure. You know, that's I had, just a, the, I had a business partner of mine say to me when the market crashed, he says, hey, Andy, you know, you watch now. They just drained the swamp. Now you get to see who all the snakes are. Yep, right? <laughs> that's right. You, you know, because like cause the reality is, is when everybody's making money, everybody's your buddy. Everybody wants to do business with you. Everybody's happy, right? But man, when it gets ugly, oof. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I really had a hard time uh, during that time period because I started uh, about 20 years ago, just like you, about 19. So when was it? Uh, 2002. So yep. that's what, 18 years ago now? Yeah. 18 years ago, I started. And uh, I did really, really well uh, going into 2007, 2008. And then I was like, I was basically bankrupt by 2008 going into 2009. I had to kind of recoup. Yeah. You know, but I didn't, I didn't give up on the business. Um, the whole point was, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, when the market is good, people are naturally going to invest in the market, kind of like the Bitcoin thing a couple of years ago. Remember that right. when Bitcoin did well, everybody was a Bitcoin investor all of a sudden overnight. And I was just looking at this guy on YouTube the other day and, uh, you know, he just popped up on my page, like the, the front page YouTube is pushing him, but the guy, um, I, just, I, was in, I was intrigued by his page. I said, okay, let me see what he's doing. Um, young guy, and he ended up uh, starting his wholesaling journey, I want to call it a few months ago. And he, all of a sudden, he's putting up YouTube videos teaching people how to do this, how, how to do wholesaling. I'm like, you haven't even mastered it yourself. <laughs> right, right, right. You know? But if you look back on his page two years ago, when he started his page, he was doing uh, Shopify. Then he did Bitcoin. Then he did, t he was selling t-shirts. Now he's into wholesaling. So, you know, <laughs> I guess he, he's following the trends. That's what he's doing. I'm right. not mad at him. I'm just saying, you know, right. don't teach people something if you haven't done it yourself. Right. You know, but, sure. um, you know so let's talk about uh, the way your business looks today. You're obviously jumping back into wholesaling and, um, you know, you're, you're going to push. What, what are some of your goals with wholesaling uh, for this year? And moving well, forward. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, this year I, I'm small time now compared to, compared to, you know, yesteryear, so to speak. Right. I, I have no aspirations to do a thousand houses in a year. I mean, I, honestly, if I do 50 to 60, I'm happy, but I, uh, 
you know, I'm uh, more about quality than quantity now, right? right. You know, and so back then our, our profit margin was very thin, just a few thousand dollars a house, right? right? I mean, way, way thin. So we had to do that kind of volume. And, um, you know, these days I'm looking for 15 to 20 grand per, per deal. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of that profit margin we're looking at. And so we can afford to, um, cherry pick, you know, and even though I'm in, you know, arguably one of the most competitive markets in the country, we just do different and better marketing than everybody else. Right. And so, although I'm not buying anything at the trustee sales anymore, cause there's really nothing to buy there right now, we just got really, really good at marketing. So, um, you know, primarily right now, all my marketing is, is really just in two, two marketing channels. One is direct mail, still working great. And the other one's, um, texting, you know, and so text blasts and, and direct mail is, is where we're at. And it's just how niche can we get with our lists and then how good are we at building rapport with the sellers. And, you know, I, I tell people whether I'm, you know, it's speaking or I'm coaching, um, whether I'm on a podcast with somebody like you or whatever, you know, we're not in the real estate business. We're in the problem solving business. That's right. You know? And so right, we've got to learn what's that person's problem because it isn't the real estate. They might think it's the real estate, but there's something else that's much bigger and we've got to figure out how to solve that. If we can figure out how to solve that problem, we'll actually get the deal even if we're making a lesser offer. So That's right, man. So, yeah. so what, what would you say, how many postcards would you say you're, spending, uh, you're sending out every single month at this point? You know, on a monthly basis, we're probably, you know, again, I'm not big time. So, um, I'd say, let me think, I'm going to think through this really quick. Between 20 and 30,000. Awesome, man. So that's costing you, that's got to run you about 10 to 15 grand a month. Roughly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got our costs down a little bit better than that, but yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so for the average person, obviously, if you're, if you're, if you're sending out that type of volume, obviously you're going to get a, a, bit, a larger break. So you're not going to spend, let's say 49 cents for a postcard you'll spend something like 23 cents, I believe it is, or something like, maybe even, are you you're probably doing a little better than that even? Well, I'm not doing that good because I don't like, again, this is just a personal preference. I don't like standard rate mail. I like first class. So I think the cheapest I can get first class down to is about 35 or 36 cents. Gotcha. Um, but, the re but the reason why I like, the reason why I like uh, first class for two different reasons. One is, I know when it's going to hit, right? We're standard rate. You don't know when it's going to hit. So like if we, we do a drop today, I know the phone's going to ring three days from now. Boom. Right? Like for sure. But the other thing, which is probably even more important to me is that the standard rate mail, they don't do returns. I want the returns. The returns are important to me because we skip trace those returns and then we're going to remail them again. And those are people that aren't getting hit. Yeah, man. So, so when you're, when you're sending out, let's just say, for example, you send out, a postcard campaign, how long would you wait in order to send out the, uh, text mat, the text blast? So we do something maybe a little bit more unique than maybe other people do. I don't know. But what I like to do is I like to mail and text the same list. And I don't care if we're doing it simultaneously. I don't even pay attention. Like we order the list, we, we it. trace it, and we just start going, you know, because, you know, direct mail – Let's say we send out, um, I don't know, let's say we send out 5,000 pieces this week or something like that, right? Because we kind of have it going out on a weekly basis. Um, but let's say I send out five or 8,000 pieces this week. Uh, P mail sits around, right? And so somebody might pick it up out of the mailbox and call me today. Somebody might just set it down on the counter and not call for two months, right? You know, and, and because mail sits around where text messages, they respond very quickly if they're going to respond at all. And you and I, both probably respond to different marketing methods, right? So like you like direct mail from a consumer standpoint. I like text messaging as a consumer, you know, just as an example. So when I do the same list, the people that are responding to the text messages aren't the same people that are responding to the direct mail. Right, right. So let me ask you this, man. And, you know, just, just kind of keep, say, you know, keeping the marketing channels in mind. Basically, when you're doing a marketing and you're doing it simultaneously. Are you, how are you tracking that? Are you utilizing two different phone numbers? How, how are you doing that? For sure. For sure. Yeah. So um, 
on the texting, it's pretty easy because we, we use a texting platform that has its own unique number. And so I have a dedicated person that just sits there and responds to those until we get them to be a lead. And then we put that into our CRM, right? On direct mail, let's say I was doing direct mail campaign to absentee owners today. Um, the absentee owners will always be this specific phone number where like if I wanted to do vacant houses next week, that's going to be a totally different number. And that's how we're tracking that. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause like we use call rail to track different um, direct mail campaign. So let's say yeah. we send out a, a vacant property campaign. That'll be one phone number. Then we'll send out, let's say a, you know, um, tax delinquent list. That'll be another phone number. Maybe water shutoffs is another yep. phone number, so on and so forth. So I was just wondering because we, who, who are you using for, for your text messaging at the moment? So for outbound text messaging, lead Sherpa, lead Sherpa. Okay. Yep. And, yep. You, and, and uh, you find that they're pretty comparable with everyone else. I haven't used them myself. That's why, you know, they were just recommended to me by one of my colleagues about nine, 10 months ago. And so we've been pretty satisfied with it. I haven't tried anything else but them. So it was just gotcha. a buddy of mine said, Hey, this is working good. I'm like, all right, let's do it. I mean, it's spendy, but it it's effective. It works. And you know, they kind of seem to know, how to keep your butt out of hot water with some of the anti spamming laws and, and, and that stuff. So I, I like not having to think about that kind of crap. Cool, man. I, I love that. So, so you, you send out, let's say 30,000, 20 to 30,000 postcards per month. You're sending out the same amount of text messaging. I'm, I'm, I'm we, we might not get that many out in text messaging. Cause typically, um, I mean, you can do the math on this yourself, but typically we can only do about, this is kind of the threshold unless you have more than one dedicated person handling it. You can probably only do about five to 800 a day text messages because then the responses start, you know, like you're sending out five to 800 a day. Imagine how many people are responding, you know, out of that. Now, not all 500 people are, but some portion is right. so you're engaging in a conversation. It takes a massive amount of time. So unless I hired somebody else to kind of do more of that outbound, that's all we're doing per day. So that's all we're doing. Plus with the, uh, you know, I, what I found and, and you know, maybe you, you're seeing this in your business as well with the uh, text messaging, you're probably only going to get about 75, about 70 to 80% of the, the numbers, uh, the people to respond as far as the numbers going out and yeah. people responding anyway. So like, let's say for example, if I send out a thousand, uh, send, uh, send out a thousand text messages, I'm probably only going to has 700 of them or six, 600 of them actually go through. Right. And I have to try a different number anyway. So right. You know, that, yeah. That, Cause the other ones are landlines or whatever. And it's just not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, so you're sending out that much. What is your staff? Like what does staffing look like for, for that? So my business right now is pretty lean. I have one person who is my, what I'd call my right hand, my direct, um, you know, assistant. And so she kind of handles all the closings and kind of all the, um, you know, a lot of our email marketing and that kind of stuff, but she also does the text blasts, right? So, um, so she'll do that, but I mean, she's kind of the catch all, right? And so I have her, she, she gets paid a salary, um, and we pay her really well. And then I have one acquisitions guy, right? So he goes out on the appointments. I don't go out on appointments anymore unless it's necessary for me to help out. Right. Um, I run the business, you know, and so I have one, one acquisitions guy who does great. You know, we, like I said, we'll do 50 to 60 houses this year. So that's roughly one a week and, you know, just wholesale. And then that allows me to be able to continue to do, you know, the, the traveling and speaking. I mean, I'm on the road, you know, eight days a month, um, mm -hmm. roughly. And then, you know, do my own coaching and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Cool, man. So you do, so you have, you said one acquisitions person and yep. then you have, so you basically have two or three people on your team. That's right. Yeah. That's, yeah. About what, that's about what I have. At, I have about three people on my team at the moment. Not in counting like the accountant, you know, which is a part-time person. Yeah, I'm not counting yeah. that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So if I counted everybody, it was like 12 of us, but sure. you know, for the yeah. most part, you know, um, two to three people on my real estate team. Yeah, that's right. I, I would say that I have two to three um, full-time people, um, you know, one's paid a salary, one's paid commission, you know, and then everybody else would be part-time people that, yeah. that add up to about what you, what you've got as well, about 10 to 12 people. Awesome. So are you doing all of the, um, the, uh, are, are you making all the offers yourself or, or is your acquisition specialist doing that? 
he does that. He, he, he usually will confer with me beforehand, but he's gotten good enough now that he doesn't need as much, uh, input from me Not anymore as he once did. Sometimes he'll say, Hey, can you comp this for me and let me know what you think? Or here's the angle I think we can get with them. You know, give me a little coaching and I just give him a little bit, um, you know, a, a little bit of direction and then he kind of takes it and runs with it. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now one thing that, in, that you know, kind of intrigues a lot of people. I use someone overseas for my acquisitions. I have two, two overseas acquisitions. Okay. Um, specialists. Um, and then I have a couple of cold callers and things like that with, you know, I have bookkeepers, accountants and, yeah. you know, uh, the whole thing, the whole, you know, the whole business setup. But the whole, uh, my question to you was, uh, is your person local at the moment or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. I've, I've, I've never done the, uh, I mean, I've done, you know, VAs before for other things like outbound calling and that kind of stuff, but I've never used them to actually, you know, ink the ink the deal. Got it. Got it. Yep. So I, I trained, so does your guy make offers over the phone or are you going out to see all of these houses? Majority of the time he's getting in front of them. Okay. Got so it. So he, he's he actually going out to over the phone. If it's an absentee owner type situation where he can't see them, but we found when we can get in front of them, um, you know, we're, we're able to figure out bigger problems. They solve yep. bigger problems. And, and, you know, we just, we get, we get, deeper discounts get a better deal that's right i find that as well although we do make offers over the phone because obviously he's not here but when we find someone that's like super hot like yesterday uh he he made an offer over the phone it was 72 grand his numbers were like spot on too it was it was nice. crazy i trained him really well but really? um i went out to see the house i ended up offering i finalized the price of 70,000 so we were only $2,000 off yeah which is really good but um, I find that, you know, he can do just as good of a job uh, as if I were to hire someone from here, except I'm paying him four bucks an hour, right. 5% five, 5 of the, uh, the, uh, the gross right. uh, 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 profit that we make. So let's say, for example, I do, let's say he, he gets a check and we close, uh, close a $10,000 deal. He's going to make an extra $500 yeah. on top of the four bucks an hour. So I find that that works out really well. Are you paying your guy an hourly wage or is he all commission? He's all commission. All commission. I love it, all man. Commission. A younger guy, college student or? No, oh, he's, he's, a, he's a guy. He's in his 30s, but he, uh, he had a real estate background in mortgages before the market crashed. Um, and, but for the last five years, he's been a stay-at-home dad. Got it. So, so, so he's, he's just looking workforce for a long time. And yeah. so this was kind of a nice way for him to kind of ease back into it, you know? Yeah, and especially if you're doing all uh, commission, you definitely got to make sure that the pipeline is being fed every single week with, with new leads. Yeah. Uh, and that, that allows him to keep his, his income high because he can easily yeah. make six figures doing something oh, like that. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, um, for sure. Awesome, man. So uh, who's handling your disposition for you at the moment? I do. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's just something that I've done for so long. I mean, I, a lot of guys, especially in my market, have, you know, these big email lists, you know, yeah. and they, you know, send out emails and whatever. And on occasion I might let them sell one of my properties for me if I, you know, if I can't move it. But for me, most of the time it's, it's a relationship thing. I just pick up the phone. I call a few people, the house is sold, you know, that's, um, you know, I've been doing it a long time. I kind of have that benefit, I guess. And so for me, that that's, that's typically how I do it. I'll send out an email to my own database, but I don't have a huge dispositions list for me. Yeah. This time it's just, I'm old school, man. I pick up the phone. Same here, man. I, you know, I have a, I have an email list, but I have to be honest, man. I probably do business with about four to five of my buyers anyway. So yeah. I usually just pick up the phone uh, and two wholesalers in my local market. Usually if I don't sell it, they sell it. Yep. I just split it with them. So, same thing. you know, it just makes life so much easier for me. Really, those are my dispositions. Yeah, uh, for sure. Guys right there. You know, for I have sure. one female and, and one male and they just, they sell pretty much everything that I get Yep. and I'm happy to split, split it with them because yeah. I don't have to do anything. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, I just, I mean, like, like you, I just pick up the phone. If one of my best buyers don't buy it, I'll shoot yeah. it out to my list. If somebody still doesn't buy it, then I call one of my, That's you know, yep. com what I'll call a competitor, but it's somebody who I, I have a relationship I've known for years. They, I know they've got a good list then they'll sell it for me. And so, you know, one way or another, we're getting it sold. It's just how much money am I going to make? That's right, man. Love it. Love it. Love it. So if we had to, 
you know, if we had to give a three-step formula, a three-step process for our listeners to uh, get started wholesaling, mm. what would be your three steps that you would recommend they take? That's great. That's a great question. Um, you, you know, wholesaling is, it, it, I'll give you three steps, but it really is, boils down to two specific things, right? I mean, it's, it's very simple. You are either deficient in leads or you're not closing, right? So there's one of these two things that isn't happening. If you've got plenty of leads coming in, then we've got to tweak your closing ability. Something's going wrong with your ability to be able to build rapport or close the seller, right? Um, if you aren't getting your phone to ring or you're not in front of enough people, then, then you don't have enough leads. So the first step I would say is, man, you've got to have leads. And so if you don't have money, um, but you got time, then you're going to be driving for dollars. You're going to be, you know, cold calling. You're going to be doing stuff that doesn't take a whole lot of money or, or any at all, but it's going to be hustling, right? And it's harder. It's hard work. I'm not going right. to sit here and tell you it's not, but man, you can get deals that way and you'll get deals I'll never get because I don't do any of that. Right. And so, um, that'd be step one, you know, is getting leads. Um, if you've got a little bit of money, then spending some money on some marketing, you know, whether it's direct mail or texting, like I'm saying, um, I mean, there's lots of ways to, to go about it. There's guys that are like phenomenal at, you know, pay-per-click and Facebook ads and stuff. I've never been that great at that, but you know, there's people that are very good at that. And so if you have kind of a tech bent, you know, go that route. Um, you know, cold calling is great. You know, there's just, you know, ringless voicemail. You and I talked about, you know, a little bit beforehand. I mean, there's different ways that we can do marketing for do sure. Something. Yeah. Door knocking, you know, I mean, there's just, you, you can do something. So depending on your budget, will depend on which one of these you do. Don't try and do them all because you're going to suck. Right. right? So, so that's step one is to find a marketing channel, one, that you can get behind and be consistent with it. If you're gonna be cold calling, know that you've got a kind of a long tail. It's gonna take four, five, six months before you really start getting those to kind of come in. You've gotta really be patient with it. You know, direct mail, you'll probably start getting deals right out of the gate. You know, within, you know, 15 to 30 days, you'll probably be getting paid. You know, I mean, it can happen that, that quickly with direct mail. So, um, so that'd be step one is get leads. You know, the number two is, is, is converting, you know? So it's, it's really about, how, how can you go about um, building rapport with the seller? So specific. Um, we're, again, we're in the problem-solving business. We're not in the real estate business. So how do I build better rapport? You're going to win deals by listening to people, talking to them, and finding out about their situation. In fact, I used to tell people, um, some of my students, I'd say, hey, people that have worked for me in the past as an acquisitions person, I'd give them one rule. You show up at the house and you talk to them about the house in the first 30 minutes, you're fired, right? I want you to spend the first 30 minutes talking to them about them, anything but the house. Talk to them about them, find, learn about them, learn about their situation, learn about what's going on with them, right? And so that'd be step two, building rapport and converting some of those leads, doing the right thing by that person. And then, and then step three is disposition. Find a way to be able to get rid of those properties quickly. And so if you're just starting out, Find somebody who's already got a list in your local market and partner with them to, to dispose of your properties for you. You're going to give up a chunk of your profit. That's okay. Go ahead and do that. They'll be happy to do it for you because they're getting paid as well. And this is an easier way for you to dispose of stuff as you're building up your own buyer's list. So those That's are right. kind of my three, three things there. Awesome. Awesome, man. So find leads, acquire the leads, sell the leads. That's, That's all right. it is. That's it, man. Awesome, man. And like you said, you know, I love the fact that you mentioned it because I say it all the time, you know, in this business, especially when it comes to marketing, you're going to invest one of two things. You're going to sacrifice something. It's going to be either time or it's going to be money. Yeah. So it's entirely up to you and your personal situation that will lead you into the right marketing channel. But I love the fact that you said to focus on one channel and good, get good at one thing, not all of them. Yes. Uh, as you get good at stuff, you can incorporate other things, but master sure. one thing. You can't, uh, you don't want to be a jack of all trades and a master at none. Mm -hmm. Be a master at one trade, do For what sure. you do and get really good at driving those leads. in. I love that, man. For sure. So what, what would you recommend someone start off? Let's say in direct mail, what would you recommend someone start off with their marketing budget? based off of their, their circumstance? It, it depends on your market. So like in my market, 
um, things are a little bit skewed because it's so highly competitive here. It's kind of guru central out here in Phoenix. So there's like a thousand wholesalers out here or whatever, like right? Tampa too. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's crazy. So, um, so you're going to have to spend more out here. So in direct mail, like I wouldn't suggest anybody doing direct mail spending less than, you know, three grand a month right? In, in my market, you know, in a big metro area, that's what I would say be your minimum. All right. If you're in a smaller market, like maybe, you know, Dayton, Ohio, or, or something like that, you could probably get, I mean, you probably get really good response of a thousand bucks or something yeah. like that. Right. You know? And so, I mean, you're going to have to fiddle with it a little bit to kind of start tracking this because you've got to really track your, what we call your KPIs, you know? And so, you know, key performance indicators is what right. KPIs stand for. And so, and so what you're really tracking is, you know, when we still send out a campaign, let's say it's, you know, just, just for simple math, we send out a thousand pieces, right? Um, first thing we want to track is what's our response rate. So a response rate is anybody that calls you, even if they're telling you to F off, right? That's a response. Okay. Um, then the next factor that you're trying to figure out is, is how many leads there are. Well, the leads are everybody that's not the FUs, right? So like the people that called that didn't say F you or take me off the list, that's that's a lead, right? Okay, so then of those leads, how many appointments do you get? And then out of the appointments, how many contracts do you get? And out of the contracts, how many deals do you get? And so we track that. And once you start to know those numbers backwards and forwards, regardless of what list you're doing, then all of a sudden you'll know, oh, when I spend a dollar, I get five back every time. Right? right. And so then all of a sudden now you can, you can go spend as much as you want, as long as you can handle the volume of, of, of calls. The key is to, you, you have to be willing to spend the money up front without looking for the return. That's right. Up front. It, it may take a couple of months. I tell people right. this all the time, but you have to plant the seeds first and then watch them sprout. Uh, that's the only way that you're going to get the phone ring. And that's the only way, unless you put in the time with cold calling, even then, you know, you're, you're a few months out, yep. but the whole point is you have to be willing to spend the money up front. Too many people are tight fisted with their money, not willing to invest in themselves or their yep. businesses in order to make it grow. That's the problem. That's yeah, why so I, many I, people I was, on a, I was on a webinar many, many years ago. This was uh, during the downside of the market. And this was uh, for a software that has nothing to do with real estate at all, but it was something I wanted to use as a CRM. Actually, Infusionsoft is what it was, right? And, and, um, and this is back when Infusionsoft was still a pretty small company. Yeah. And, and they, uh, they ha had this guy on the webinar and, and he's, he's talking about, you know, he was actually the CEO of the company. And he's saying, you know, this, the market's not doing real well right now. We're trying to get this thing going. And my, my partner says, who's this you know, I'm looking at the financials here and who's this person, Mark, who, who's getting paid twice as much as you and I are. I don't understand. Why is Mark making so much money? And he says, Mark's just short for marketing and he's always going to get paid more than us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, man. I like you that. <laughs> you know, I like that. That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, what happens is, is when people, businesses start to get scary or they're not making as much, their natural inclination is, is I'm going to stop marketing. Oh man, you stop marketing. You're out of business, man. You cannot stop marketing. You, I mean, double down, triple down if you have to, because this is the only way that you're going to be able to survive. That's right, man. If your phone is not ringing, you're not in business. Period. That's right. Period, that's man. That's the, that's it. That's the end all be all of it all. Yep. So, I know you're doing a lot of different things right now. You know, I know that um, you, you mentioned that you're going to be doing events on your own. If our listeners wanted to get in contact with you, how, how should they do that? Oh, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Well, I'm pretty active on Instagram. Um, I'm under Wingman Werner. So last name W-E-R-N-E-R. -E -E so at Wingman Werner. Um, I'm on there almost every single day so they can DM me on there. They can, uh, you know, follow my stories or my posts or whatever. Um, I typically about once every week or once every two weeks, I'll do a new YouTube video. I kind of put out just free, um, you know, stuff just for people to kind of learn about and whatever, just value add kind of stuff. And so you can find me, Andrew Werner, Andy Werner, um, there fairly easily. And you know, that's, those are probably the two best ways. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn and all the other channels as well, but I'm most active on Instagram. Got it, man. And you know what I'll do. For those of you listening on the podcast here, I'll link, I'll, I'll uh, you can go to youtube.com slash, what is it, Andy Werner's 
page. I think it's Andrew. Yes. Forward Andrew. slash Andrew Werner. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So youtube.com forward slash Andrew Werner, if you're listening on the podcast, but if you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, yep. I'll go ahead and link. Uh, Perfect. I'll go ahead and link Andy's page up at, up in the cards up at the top. She'll Perfect. Popping up uh, sometime. So definitely uh, check out Andy's page. Great content. Obviously he's an active wholesaler in his local market. Now, a quick question for you, man. If you had to give some advice for our listeners just getting started out right now mm. um, and, they, and they're struggling right now, what would that advice be? Yeah, the, the advice that I'd give, and I'd give this to somebody just starting out or even somebody who's just going through a tough season of their life. You know, it'd be the same advice. It's to hang in there and keep pushing forward. You know, things will get better. Things will get easier. You know, I mean, life isn't about, things being easy. It's about a learning process and it's about us getting stronger as a result of that. I mean, you know, muscles don't get big on your body without going to the gym, right? right and so it's the same with, you know, your bank account, it's same with your brain, none of that stuff expands without us really putting in the work. And so if you're struggling right now, if you're thinking, man, is this actually worth it? Absolutely. It's worth it. You're worth it, you know? And so you just right. got to put in the time, keep believing in yourself. Um, get mentors. I mean, seriously, even if you can't afford coaching or mentorship right now, there is so many people putting out free content on YouTube and podcasts and stuff like that. If you're just willing to sit down and consume that and then actually take action on what they're teaching. I mean, Jamal right here is sitting here giving you guys a, a, a whole bunch of stuff for free. He's got a podcast, right? He's not charging for his podcast. If you just pay attention to his podcast or other people's podcasts alone, and then you take action to what it is that they're teaching you, and your life can totally change, but you just got to keep your head up and just believe in yourself and keep pushing forward. That's right, man. And, and, and like you said, man, you know, you can't, you can't build muscle without going to the gym. You know, some people, some people learn in different ways and others, it takes t more time mm. for them to, to become successful. You know, what do you say to those, those people you, you mentioned veterans? What do you say to those individuals that, have been doing this for several years, maybe five, 10 years, and they're still not, you know, anywhere near where they want to be. Should they just give up or should they keep pushing forward? Heck, heck no, don't ever give up. Not ever, ever, ever. Um, what I would say is, is, man, if you can, even if it's not somebody you're paying for, but it's somebody who is where you want to be, right? Like, hey, you see this person over here and they're in your business. Um, they, they, they Maybe they're in a different market or something like that. and and, and you kind of get close to them, right? And you can just ask them to take a look at what it is that you're doing right now so they might be able to give you some um, feedback, right, on how it is that you could do better, right? You know, what it is that you could change. Because sometimes it can be such a simple little shift. It can be such a, a little teeny thing. And we all as humans get so deep in the weeds, right, of our own lives. We, we can't see the forest through the trees, right? And then you know, Jamal comes over and he says, Andy, look at this stupid thing you're doing right here. All you got to do is do this. And you're like, holy cow, he was right. And that's all I had to do. Right. And so like, for those of you that are veterans out there that you got that going on, get somebody else's eyeballs on what you're doing, because I promise it's probably a little shift. You know, maybe it's a tweak. It's a, it's a different look. If I was still trying to buy houses at the tr trustee sales right now, I'd be starving. Yeah. Right. Cause nobody's in foreclosure. Right. I had to go learn something totally different than I'd ever learned before. For the first eight years of my entire career, I only bought properties at the trustee sale. I didn't know how to do direct mail marketing. I did not do any of that. I had to learn and I'll have to learn something else a few years from now, I'm sure. Right. So constantly always learn. It's never stop yep. learning or growing. Not evolve. Ever. You have yep. to evolve. Yep. You know, you, there's a, there's, um, I guess an old adage, you, you can't climb a mountain. You know how, how you climb a mountain one step at a time. That's right. So you got to just, you know, take it as it comes. Of course, there's going to be hurdles. You know, there's going to be, you know, trees down on that mountain, but that's not going to stop you. You're not going to go all the way back down the mountain. That's right. What are you going to do? You're going to find a way around the tree, around the hurdle and keep going. Eventually you will reach the top. You just have to keep pressing forward, but you can't stop in the middle. You can't give up right. because then you're going to get up. drained out. Well, and the way that we can separate ourselves from our competition, and even if your competition is just how you're measuring yourself against your yesterday self, right? Love the way it. that you get better is by doing the little things consistently, right? So like, you know, Warren Buffett talks about compound interest, right? You invest that dollar and if you got it invested in the right thing, it compounds over time. And it's like, you know, the, 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 
another, you know, wonder of the world, right? The eighth wonder of the world, you know, Einstein, I think called compound interest. Well, it's the same thing for us on doing the little things, right? You know, I mean, if, if you're going just to use like a workout analogy, if you start going to the gym at five o'clock every morning and you do that religiously and you're doing that for an hour from five to six every single morning, five days a week, six months from now, man, your whole body and your feeling about yourself and everything is dramatically different because you did this little thing consistently over and over and over again. So you got to do the same thing in your real estate business, whether it's picking up the phone and making calls or texting or sending out your direct mail or whatever, do it consistently and don't stop. Do the little things that nobody else will do. Like a lot of people won't take those returns that I was talking about. You know, we get these returns and then we skip trace those and we mail them again, right? Because we know that that's where the gold is, right? It's just yep. doing those little things over and over and over again. That stuff over time will compound. And then all of a sudden you'll, you'll have like a snowball rolling down a mountain. Yep, exactly. That's the true secret to, to success in this business is just being consistent. There's no, it's not rocket science. Nope. If you can, if you can be consistent longer than the next guy, you will be more successful than the next guy. And another thing that you mentioned, I love the fact that you said, uh, compare yourself to your yester self, right? Don't compare yourself to everyone else yep. because, you know, you don't know what their life is like. You don't know what, what resources they have. You don't know what they're going through in their, in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about how everybody on Instagram is uh, filthy rich. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's what they want you to believe. Right. <laughs> so they want you to believe. Right. So you can't compare yourself to what everyone else is doing. Compare yourself to yourself. Yeah. And that's how you're going to get For uh, sure. where you want to be, because then you're, you'll, you'll have that true fulfillment. You know, yeah. you're not, you're not living for, you're not living vicariously through someone else. You're not living to try to compete or try to uh, live up to someone else's expectations of you. Yeah. What you're doing is you're living uh, according to your, what, what your purpose is for your life. That's right. You know? And that's exactly um, what you should be doing. You know, so if, if you want to, you know, I, I was talking to S Scott Jelinek. Yeah, Scott. Love Scott. He, he said he sold his $110,000 car and he got a Honda, Honda Accord. Right. You know? But he's, he says he's completely debt free. His mortgage is paid up in full. And he makes six figures just about every single month, you yep. know, that he designed that for himself. He's not, he's not competing against anyone else, but himself. That's right. You know, I absolutely love that, man. So, you know, don't you worry notice, about. You notice on, uh, on Instagram, it's just the young guys that got all that blingy stuff, you know, whether they're renting yep. it or they own it or whatever, that's a young guy's game, man. I yep. mean, it's cool. I, I don't have any problem with that. If that's your thing. Yeah. But, I've been through, I've been through the ringer as have you, you know, we went through that yep. down market, man. I'll tell you what, having yourself be lean, have lots of cash yep. and cash flow. Woo -wee, that's way better than having a Lambo. And <laughs> I, I said that years ago, man, I, you know, I gave up trying to be Mr. Flashy yep. and um, we, you know, at the end of the day, that's how that's to me, that's where you get the real time and freedom from. For sure. You know, the real time and freedom, which is what people ultimately want out mm -hmm. of this business. So yeah, fantastic sure. call, man. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks, I love it, man. Great, yeah. great information that you shared with us. Again, for those of you uh, looking to get more information from Andy, uh, go to his YouTube page or his Instagram. Uh, yeah. He said wingman. What is it? Wingman. Wingman Werner. So last wingman name. Werner. Yeah. Wingman Werner on Instagram or yeah. uh, check him out on YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash Andrew Werner. Yep. Definitely check out his videos. Great stuff. Obviously, he provided a lot of content on uh, uh, today's podcast as well. And I'm looking forward to having you again sometime in the future, man. Oh, for sure, man. I'd do it anytime. I appreciate it, brother. Awesome, awesome, man. Yeah. So, look, guys, uh, definitely check out Andy's page. And um, if you want more information on how to get started wholesaling and hearing it from a different perspective, I know we've had several wholesalers on here, but everyone has a different perspective. Definitely go out and check uh, Andy's, uh, his page out. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, we, we appreciate you guys listening in on today's podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jamal. I appreciate it. Likewise, man.